In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said earlier, this past Thursday was the 40th day after Easter, and the great feast of the Ascension of Jesus. It's always on a Thursday, and so it's unusual for us to be able to focus on it on a Sunday. But today I want to look at that feast and why the Ascension matters to us. Why do we care? Why does it matter that Jesus lifted off the ground, 11 disciples watched him as he ascended into the clouds and on off out of their vision all the way into heaven, where he now resides? What does that whole event actually mean to us? Well, after appearing to dozens of people over those 40 days since the resurrection, now Jesus is leaving his disciples. Up to the very moment, it seems, that Jesus lifted from the ground to go into heaven, it seems his disciples still were puzzled. They were still trying to figure it all out. What did all this actually mean? We'd be the same, wouldn't we? I mean, imagine what all in the last uh, 45 days, what they've gone through from Palm Sunday to the Last Supper to Gethsemane, the crucifixion, the resurrection, Jesus appearing to them in so many different and diverse places. Hundreds of people saw him, and now we're on this hillside, and he's lifting off the ground going into heaven. I'd be very puzzled. I think all of us would be, and, and so were those disciples. But the scripture tells us that after the ascension, they worshipped him. They worshipped Jesus. They traveled back into the city, into Jerusalem, and it says they did it with great joy. They maintained a regular presence in the temple, worshipping him, blessing him, clearly waiting for something, but feeling joyful as they waited. This wasn't a hunker down, we're scared kind of time for them. It was a, we're hunkered down together, but we're joyful. We're worshiping, and we're just waiting. Well, you know, at first, you think about that, and that reaction of joy, it catches me a little bit off guard. I mean, here Jesus had just left them, and they're happy. They're filled with joy. Now, why would that be? Remember, whenever he told them uh, at the Last Supper that he'd be leaving, they were greatly distressed. Now he actually did leave, but they're filled with joy. And so he was encouraging them. There was an encouragement this time that he gave them, and it was about the ministry of the Holy Spirit that he said was to come upon them. So he didn't just leave. He said, leave and wait, and my spirit is coming. He kept them, I think, uh, from the brink of utter despair, by saying, you're not losing me, but I'm going to be with you. I'm just going to be with you in a very different way now. I'm going to be with you through my spirit. And so the ascension of Jesus produced this joy in the disciples because they were starting to realize the amazing benefits that would come to them when Jesus returned to the Father. Now they were getting a glimpse of what was in it for them when he ascended into heaven to be with his Father. What did they benefit? Well, all the promises about the Holy Spirit uh, coming to his disciples were going to be fulfilled. They knew that was coming. Something wonderful was about to come upon them, and they just couldn't wait. And they were joyful because they accepted Jesus' word now. Their doubts and fears seemed to drain away. They were convinced now of who he was. If someone raised from the ground into heaven in front of you, I think that does a lot to take away doubts, doesn't it? They knew now that he had died to forgive them of their sins. They understood that. He knew he was alive, even though they were sure he had been dead. And this resurrection meant hope in eternal life for them too. They would also have victory over death. 
Basically, they trusted him and all he had told them. So you see, I think the benefits to you and me of the ascension are actually, there are many, but actually four that I want to just look at briefly. The first is that by Jesus being taken into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, that's the place of authority, the right hand. That was a verification and a confirmation that the penalty and the punishment due for sin was paid up. Jesus had done the work that he was sent to earth to do. A big difference from what? Just 43 days earlier when hanging on the cross, the father forsook the son. Why have you forsaken me, Jesus said, a long way from there to today when he now sits at the right hand of that same father. So the penalty of sin paid up, gone over. Man and God reconciled. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he then sat down at the right hand of the Father. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's you and me. He has perfected you and me for all time by the single offering he made for our sin. So that's now a fact. That's the first great benefit of the ascension to you and me. Secondly, now with Jesus there at the right hand of the Father, we have a mediator and an advocate right there beside the Father. We pray each week about Jesus as our own mediator and advocate. That's where he sits. He is right there at the side of the Father. Um, John, in his first letter, put it this way. He writes, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So not only has the penalty for sin been paid, now if we do sin, we have an advocate at the right hand of the Father advocating, mediating for us. So when the Father looks at us, he sees the sinlessness of his Son at his right hand. That's the second benefit. The third is when Jesus ascended, his reign over all his enemies now began. The authority that, season, that Satan had, um, had had over the earth ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, that reign now was over. And now Jesus himself had taken the authority again. He now had authority. His reign as king now begins over the earth. Peter wrote it this way. Now that he has gone into heaven, he is at God's right hand. Now with the angels and the authorities and the powers subject to him. So that's the third benefit to us. He is now the reigning king. And fourth, finally, when Jesus ascended, the church was now being empowered for its mission. Now all of us have a hand in bringing about the kingdom that Jesus as king seeks and prophesies that he will bring about in this world. Here's the way Paul wrote it in his letter to the Ephesians. He wrote, God the Father put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus, now as head over the church, empowers us for mission, empowers us to be part of his work in the world. So those are four benefits I see of the resurrection that makes a difference to you and me. So Jesus is the king of the universe and the evil forces of the world now can do nothing about that. Jesus is now king, but here's what they can do is they can tempt us to forget about who Jesus is and where he is. It can convince us to forget 
that he is the king and that he is at the right hand of the Father. You'll remember in the book of Acts when Stephen, the disciple Stephen, was stoned by the Jewish leaders and as he's being stoned, he looks up to the heaven and what does he see? He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He saw him there. That New Testament story tells us to picture that and to have a confidence that Jesus our Savior is the King over all things. It gives us a, a settled confidence, I think, knowing that Jesus is there and who he is. So there's joy and there's hope and mission. And those have been the three consistent responses of the church and of the disciples ever since the resurrection and the ascension. And so we see the disciples and how they were transformed as people and then they were mobilized to follow Jesus on mission and following Pentecost, which we celebrate in a week, they were off on mission in a powerful, powerful way, weren't they? So you and I go forward with that same hope and with that same joy because the king of the universe promises he will never leave us or forsake us. So if we want to experience that kind of transformation, that transformation the disciples had in their lives that took a simple fisherman like Peter and turns him into this great orator on the day of Pentecost preaching to the to people from all over the world, including Jewish leaders, that kind of transformation. If we want that and we want the joy that follows Jesus when we are on mission with him, then we build our confidence on the finished and sufficient work Jesus did. And the ascension marks that, that event for us, the completion of his work now, once and for all. So in a time like this, when we're in a pandemic, we see hundreds of thousands of people dying in just a matter of months, and some of it hitting really close to home, right here in our own, in our own communities. What does the ascension mean to us in light of all that? I think it means the same thing it meant to those disciples that day as they returned to Jerusalem. Joyful and worshiping, they now knew they had an advocate with the Father, and so do we. That father who is really the one in control and loves us more than we can imagine is our hope. The father who was in control when the Romans and the Jewish leaders came for the disciples' heads in the days and weeks to come. The same father who's in control when our lives are threatened by a virus. And like those disciples, we are joyful and we worship him because now we put our trust in him. Amen. Amen.